Okay, Genesis chapter 11. This evening's theme is confusion of tongues. Confusion of tongues. Uh, Not in the sense that uh, we're communicating with one another or God is communicating with us, which is definitely a great teaching, right? Communication, that's probably the number one struggle in all our relationships is how to communicate uh, something to one another so that we uh, can understand but that's another subject this is talking about how God confuses man's tongue because they're doing something that is disobedient and dishonoring to God in fact they're outright in rebellion uh, to God the account of the Tower of Babel is found here and we've all read that story one time or another or have heard of that story and it's one of the saddest stories in the old testament and probably one of the most important historical stories of the bible speaking from linguistics and nationalities and so forth and separations of nations sad because of the rebellion that it depicts in mankind. Of course, you can go anywhere before that, starting in Genesis with Adam and Eve and how the woman took the first step to eat of that fruit, knowing very well that she was not supposed to, but was convinced by the enemy to do so. So she became disobedient and rebellious to God. And then, of course, the man followed right along. And so... It's a sad place to be in rebelliousness. Uh, You have to justify that somehow in order to feel better about yourself. But also historically because of the world's culture that is birthed from the Tower of Babel. This is where God confuses their tongue and then separates all the various nations that we have uh, existing today. Um, And we'll talk a little bit about that. So... um, kind of top heavy this message in the sense that the story of Babel is in the top of the chapter and then it kind of gets into genealogies and it kind of kind of slowly enters into the life of Abram who later on becomes Abraham and Sarai who becomes Sarah in the future so it's kind of leading into that but first uh, the first few verses here um Actually, first four verses deal with this rebellion. So the building of Babel. Let's go ahead and read the first three verses. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Uh, It's a fertile valley. Uh, There's plenty of water. Uh, It's probably the ideal place to build, to live, to dwell together. It's by the Euphrates River. And so uh, they chose it kind of like we'll see later on down the road. Lot chooses a piece of land that's very green and and is going to be profitable to him. So they landed in that plain there and they dwelt there. Verse 3. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. So we see immediately in this chapter that the whole earth had one language and one speech. Now, I have studied this verse, just this verse alone, for years, trying to understand what he's trying to say there to us, a language and one speech. And I've talked with other people about it and gotten their ideas, and I still don't know what it's talking about here. Um, I'm not even sure if, if it's really saying that they, at that time, there was only one language that mankind was speaking, and we'll see that in a second. It's commonly thought that before the Tower of Babel attempt, was tried there was only one language the broader context though seems to say that it's the opposite if you look at chapter 10 verse 5 verse 20 verse 31 it mentions it mentions languages being spoken by the descendants of of his three sons so now is there a contradiction there is he saying that there's one language? Well, there obviously is not a contradiction because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It's God's word, and so either we believe the whole thing or we don't. And if that's a contradiction, right now I will close this book, I will walk out, and I'll go get a job because then I'm worshiping and I'm serving here in vain if it's not true. But I believe that the Bible is true. Uh, I just don't understand what this is saying here, and I'm not going to 
pretend that I do understand it. It could be a lot of things and it's just guesses. It could be that each tribe did speak one language. It could be that all the tribes knew one language and one speech and then they used that speech. I don't know. It doesn't say, but I know that the Bible is true. Uh, linguistics uh, differ. Differences seem to be the reason uh, they were living in clans and in territories. You know, obviously they had the three sons and they all joined together in a different clan, speaking in different languages. Whether they understood each other, you know, um, is, is definitely there that they did and so forth. Um, linguists who are scholars in it, and these are people who study it with PhDs and so forth, and they, they affirm that all languages can be studied, and as they study all known languages or even read of certain languages, they have found some interesting things. They have found that all of these different languages have borrowed intensively from one another, and they can trace it all the way back to just one language. So that's interesting that uh, the educated and that know and understand languages can trace back um, all the way as far as even through the Hebrew, because the Hebrew language came later on through Abraham. And so even before that, whatever language it was that they, they spoke uh, at that time. Now, another point here is the fact that they were in unity. So it's not necessarily the language that's the problem here with God. It's not the language at all. That's not the issue. There's nothing wrong with speaking in different languages. They're speaking in one language and able to... Um, that's weird. I don't know why it would beep when I have it off. Another aspect of this is that unity... is not always a good thing in the world. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there is nothing inherently wrong with unity and working together to build things, but it's not necessarily the right thing to do, spiritually speaking, in the world. In fact, it must have seemed like a great idea to build and to build a tower and to get together in unity. I think the early church even thought that was a great idea uh, to sell everything and to have a commune and meet together. It seems to be a great idea today because we have this push for one world government, one world currency, and it just makes things a lot easier, it seems, but there's a problem with it, and that is, is that someone has to be in charge, and usually that person that is in charge is the one that... Um, has the flaws and the struggles in their lives and ends up misusing their powers and authority in a bad sense. Somebody has to rule, someone has to be rich, someone has to take away and so forth. So having that unity in the world is not necessarily always a good thing, but it is always a good thing within the church to have unity. In fact, someone said that um, if you if you cannot find that unity in a church or if you find that unity in a church don't be the one to disturb that unity and God talks a lot about dividing the body of Christ such a bad place to be and be the one to divide the body of Christ um, you know and that's happened here I don't know how many times and when I was at the other Calvary that happened at that Calvary I don't know how many times and as I go to pastors uh, meetings and talk with other pastors it happens at their church all the time because there's always someone who just knows what's right above the leadership above the church and they're going to come in and they're going to fix everything for some reason and they end up uh, dividing the body of Christ and destroying the church and, and that's fine you let them go and ultimately one day they stand before God and they will stand before God and be held accountable for that unfortunately that's something that they don't will not get away with because God will take everything that we do here on this earth if we're Christians and he will look at it and whether it's it's gold, silver, or stubble and you'll be rewarded accordingly. Don't disturb the unity. <clears throat> the idea was to concentrate to build a powerful group, cities instead of obeying God's commandment. That's really it because it's not the unity that's necessarily the sin here at all. Don't misunderstand that. Well, they were trying to get together and they're building this tower. No, it's not it. That's not it. In fact, it wasn't even the, what it really was was disobedience, but that is what led to a further sin, which was idolatry because they were building these towers to worship idols. 
other than God Almighty. So their real sin was disobedience. They didn't obey God. And if you go back to chapter 9, Genesis 1, uh, God, like he did in, in Genesis chapter 1, who, who spoke to Adam and even said, be fruitful and multiply. And then in chapter 9, once the flood was all over, what did he do to know in them? He also said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So the command, the direction of God, the plan of God was to be fruitful and multiply. Just a simple request. Look, uh, the world has been flooded. Millions have been perished, you know, and now I want you to repopulate the earth. And I want you to do that quickly, um, rather quickly. And yet they decided that that wasn't a good idea. That, that wasn't a good enough plan. Uh, they decided that God didn't know what he was talking about. God didn't understand things. He didn't understand the economics of it all. You know, he didn't understand the dynamics of the family. He didn't, whatever it was, you know, he just doesn't know. And so we're going to do something different. We're going to gather together and, and we're just going to keep a nice tight group and we're just going to build a tower and we're going to worship uh, God, our God, the image that we make him into. Uh, that's human pride is being in control. That's the sin of Adam and Eve. That was the sin that Satan whispered into Eve's ear. That the day if you eat of the fruit, then you, you will realize that you're like him, knowing good and evil. And so you can reason and understand and be in control of your own life. They ignore God's clear instruction in favor of their own wisdom. Their own wisdom. A hundred years later, after the flood, Nimrod builds this city in Shinar, a city built with bricks because there were no stones in that area, so they had to make bricks, asphalt, which was a mineral pitch, and they, it would harden as mortar between the bricks there. Uh, and then later on, these cities were located and became places like Babylon, places like Akid or Kalish. And these were places where there was full of idolatry because of this one man, Nimrod, who was a mighty man on earth, as Genesis 10.8 says. Uh, Chronicles affirms that in chapter 1, verse 10, a mighty man on earth. Genesis 10.9 talks about him being a mighty hunter. Um, pride comes with power. I believe when you're strong, when you're strong-willed, when you're strong thinker, when, you're, when you make decisions, when you choose to do something, I believe that there's a po great possibility of sin to take place uh, because then you become God and you start taking control, you start manipulating, you start changing and that's where sin creeps in because you are very powerful like this man, a mighty man of the earth. I mean, he was a mighty man. He had followers. People would follow him. Uh, he could understand things and that's something that's, that people liked and it could give you some pride. It could lift you up and so forth. Um, I remember Chuck Swindoll talking about being a professor and he would pray for those that were handsome and very smart kids. These were young kids in the, in the Christian a university and he said the reason was is because they're smart and they're handsome and they could easily fall easily fall and that makes total sense and eventually they all became a wasteland here Micah 5 6 talks about uh, they shall waste with the sword in that land now this tower that they built is in the shape of a ziggurat it says which is a stair stepped pyramid shape it's edifice reaching high, as it says, to the heavens. And it was used for pagan practices of astrology, observation. They'd go to the very top and read the stars. This is where the Chaldeans came from. These were the groups that Daniel uh, had to deal with in Babylon and so forth. Literally, it could be said that it's called, it was a stairway to heaven in a sense and to understanding and direction. Today we can open up the Enterprise or the Herald or exam paper and look at horoscopes and it's uh, a way for us to look into the stars and see what our futures hold. Well that's sin too if you're looking at the horoscope and you're putting your faith and trust in what some man is telling you, the alignment of the stars is and this is what you're day is going to be like because of your 
birth day in a certain position and so forth. Uh, so in a, here we see this picture of human effort and only, um, only God can really give them what they're looking for. Interesting, in archaeology, they have found two dozen mud brick towers built like pyramid forms there in, in modern Iraq, which they believe came from this time uh, of Babylon and probably of Nimrod itself. So we have historical evidence of these towers being there. Ancient tradition tells us that the ziggurats were also communication towers. Uh, by which people were able to communicate with one another through using some sort of crystals, which is interesting. We don't understand how it worked. We do use crystals in, in radio frequencies, and you can adjust those crystals in, in receiving radio frequencies. And so if you can imagine uh, some of the Stone Age stuff that we see today and rocks that were built and things like that, and you wonder, how did they do those things? Door tons of uh, of rocks can just move on a hinge like you know and you go why did they do that we don't we have no idea but w if you understand that god had given adam and eve such great wisdom and understanding of things and that wisdom then began to diminish because of sin then it makes any it makes a lot of sense and nimrod building these towers all over using crystals they were able to communicate with one another the first iphones who knows how it worked you know but somehow they they did it, you know. And we really do have to admit looking at this and not necessarily building of the towers where they could communicate because the real sin was disobedience to God. God told them what he wanted them to do and they disobeyed him. We must admit that today men and women are not above the ancient sin of Babel. Uh, the world thinks of themselves as wiser than God. Now think about that for a second. This is how the world views it. I, I know things more than God knows. I'm wiser than him. And if God says something in his word, no, no, that's not for today. We're living in modern times. God didn't understand the dynamics of our day and age, and so he really doesn't mean that today. See, we become wiser than God. How important is it to be obedient? Do you think God believes that obedience is important to the Christian man or woman. And I'm talking to the real Christian man or woman, by the way, because a real Christian man or woman will be obedient because they totally understand it no matter what. Obedience is very important to the Lord. He told Samuel, I'd rather have obedience above sacrifices and offerings. And see, some people will offer up sacrifices and offerings uh, they'll say praise the Lord, they'll say hallelujah, they'll go to church, they'll do all these different things, but obedient is not in there. Obedience is above all those things. God wants obedience. But we justify it by suggesting that God doesn't know what he's doing, that I'm wiser than God. Oh, God wants to populate the earth? No, let's not do that. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is we want to build a tower. We want to commune together and keep things simple. That's too complicated. Look, uh, look what happened in the past when the world was populated and he flooded the earth. We don't want that to happen again. But God has a purpose and a reason. I mean, we can say things like, surely God will understand if we fudge on this commandment a little. I mean, he's going to love me, isn't he? He's going to have grace on me, isn't he? I mean, just a little fudge here and there. I mean, he's not going to get too upset. I mean, it's almost like, like, God has been so faithful to demand obedience for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years and all of a sudden you come along. Oh, I can, I can have an exception for you. No, it don't work that way. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow forever. There are no exceptions to his word because his word is truth. And so obedience is very important to the Lord. And this was the sin of Babel. <clears throat> now we come to this rebellion at the tower. Look at verse 4. And they said, come let us build ourselves a city. Now highlight that. And the tower whose top is in the heavens. And the phrase in the Hebrew seems to express as, as high as we can. In other words, let's, let's go as high as we can get that thing. We see modern day 
uh, architects today trying to get higher than the last guy, you know, and it seems to be a pride thing. How much higher can we go from the last guy so my name's known? And that's exactly what they, they here want to do. Nothing's changed because the next phrase says, let us make a name for ourselves. At least we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So two things, let us and let us. You see, it's about us. It's about me. It's about what I want. I want to build ourselves a city. I don't want to populate the earth. I want a name for myself. There's more for me out there. there there's so much possibility. And if I take time to have a family, if I take time to have children, if I take time to raise them, I've missed out on, on what could have been, you know, because of all of that and so forth. So it's about us. And that's why they say, let us. And anytime we start with us or I want or I think, then you're sinning. It's not what I, you know, here, here's the bottom line. It's not what I want and it's not what I think. It's what God wants, really. His word is very clear, right? And we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. We've confessed him. We bowed our knee to him. And now we've asked him to lead and guide us. So really, we should follow him and not question the things that he's asking us to do as these people did. We see the lust for power and how it corrupts. And we see that they took these bricks and built this great tower whose top was to the heavens so that they could make a name for themselves. Kind of the mantra of our ages today. It's all about making a name for yourself, about being the richest person, about having the most stuff out there, the things you wear, the things you drive and, and so forth. It's all about us. Even within churches, you know, in, in we need to be careful. It's not about the size of the church because you want to be bigger than the other church because you want a name for yourself. It's, that's not important. What's important is the growth of the church spiritually, the maturity of the church. Uh, it is why the Pharisees, uh, like some of us, love to do their religious deeds where men could notice them because they could make a, known f a name for themselves. Oh, that guy's a righteous man. You know, that guy's a, he's on fire for the Lord. He must be really holy. You know, do things in humility. Self-promotion is simply what we want in the Western world. One of the first marks of a rebellious spirit is to disobey God. And at the same time, to elevate self and to try to act like God. Pride is that destroying quality that destroys us. They wanted to be somebody and not just any other person that was scattered in the whole earth. Listen to what John said in his little epistle. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is, is not of the Father. What does he mean by that? It's not of the Father. It's not of the Father. He has nothing to do with it. Well, who it's of? It's of Satan. That's his baby. All of that stuff belongs to him and it is contrary to God and it is in rebellion to God. It is of the world and the world is perishing away in the lust of it, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Obedience, obedience. Pride goeth before destruction, Proverbs sixteen eighteen says. <clears throat> I think we need to really ask ourselves constantly, am I purchasing this item seeking to promote myself am i performing this service so that i can meet or feel better about myself attracting attention to myself live more comfortably for myself i mean those are the things that we need to ask ourselves because not because living godly is not always living comfortably or am i doing it for the glory of god that's what we should be doing for the glory of god how does this glorify God? How does this glorify his word and what he has written down? That's important to me more than anything else, more than my feelings and more than my emotions. I think if Nimrod would have asked that of himself, how can we glorify God? I know how. Let's be obedient and let's populate the earth instead of build a tower and a name for ourselves. 
I think we need to be careful that you try to brand your name, brand your church. Um, it is a matter of the heart, and God has to touch that heart and give it humility. Now look at the judgment on these families in verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they purposed to do will be withheld from them. Then he says, Come, let us go down and their confuser language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Uh, Babel can mean gateway to God as a tower, or it can mean as it becomes confusion. It's just babbling. Because, the Lord, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord stretched or scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Now, first thing that we notice that I think is important is the Trinity there in verse 7 when he said, let us go down there. Uh, speaking of the Trinity, Elohim, speaking of one yet three persons there. And God said us he they took notice the trinity of what man was doing he wasn't approving it by the way it seems like in verse six that he might be approving it because they're purposing to do what is in them but god is not approving it just because someone doesn't say something and because someone allows someone to do that doesn't necessarily mean that they approve of it or if it's the right thing to do you can have 100 people doing something and you join them because there's 100 people doing it, but it doesn't mean that it is the right thing to do. So God just allows them and he says, okay, now let's confuse them. Let's confuse their language because they're building this tower. I think what God is saying here, look, their sin has been unchecked. They've been building, and now we need to put them in check, and we need to correct them. And so let's do this by confusing their language so they're no longer able to communicate one with another. Now, again, it could be that they all spoke different languages, but they were all able to communicate in language and speech. And now God just changes all their language. So now, if you can only imagine, here you're speaking Spanish, and then all of a sudden you start speaking French, and you're going, what? I have no idea what you just said. You know, and the guy says, what are you saying? I have no idea. And then another guy's speaking Chinese, and another guy's speaking, you know, Tabalic from, from uh, uh, Philippines, you know, and all these other languages, and they're all just going... What's going on? I, I don't understand you. And they decide to, that, that all of a sudden they come across another guy. Hey, you speak my language. Okay, let's get together. And then you speak my language. Let's get together. And they all of a sudden move and get scattered abroad all over the face of the earth. And that's how the nations began to form at that time according to the Bible. God then divides them completely there confuse their language or literally their lips as the Hebrew text says. And then we come to the generations of Shem. Remember Shem is the son of Noah. Shem is in the line of Christ and so it's important that he give us the genealogy here. I'm not going to go through all of these but um, if you'd like to go through them that's fine. Uh, this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begot uh, all of these guys uh, two years after the flood. But what's important is that we see um, there in verse 25, Terah, Nabor, lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. And Terah was 75 when he begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Abram is Abraham, as we will see the family tree of Abraham. So Shem brought Abraham in, who would be the father of the Jewish race at that time. When you look at verses 10 through 32 really closely and you go to Luke chapter 3, you can actually compare them and they're like right on. 
the same name, same genealogies, right on. Again, it's more evidence of the Bible that it, it, it is the word of God and we can trust it. And now we come to the generations of Abraham. Now his genealogy through his father, Terah, verse 27, begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. So, so we see now Lot introduced here in the text. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. So there's Ur, the Chaldeans. Again, time has passed. The nations are spreading. The astrologers are now considered Chaldeans. Uh, they're living in the land of Ur. It is a Gentile world. It's corrupt. It's wicked. It's evil. They're worshiping uh, probably the moon, the star gods, and, and, and so forth. And this is the atmosphere that Abraham is living in. Like us, we're living in an atmosphere where there is just so many different religions. You know, you can basically divide all religions into three groups. You have the cosmos, uh, that's a religious system, the cosmos, where they believe that there's nothing that is out there that proves there's deity at all. It's just the stars, it's the galaxies, it's the universe, it's just life, uh, uh, evolution, atheism, all dwells within the cosmos. Uh, there's no God in there at all. Um, just cosmos, just stars. And then you, you can look at the cosmos and God where they mix the two together. Okay, there's cosmos, but then there's also God. Somehow God or gods, Greek mythology, uh, more than Mormonism kind of thing, um, all gods and different gods and pantheism and so forth are all dwelled within that one group. Spiritualism, a new age philosophies and so forth where they become gods. And then there's the middle one and that's where uh, we find Christianity where it, it's, it's God. It's just God. And he created everything else. We're living in a time where we have the cosmos and we have the cosmos and gods and yet we know the truth. And so in a sense, we're like Abraham living in a world that's all confused. And so how much more important for us as true believers to let our light shine to be different from the world? because the world has no hope. And the only hope that they see is in us as we serve and are obedient to the Lord. That is the responsibility that we have as believers. And that should be something that is esteemed highly in our life. We should desire that because it is an honor and a privilege to be in that position, to be a leader, to be a light, to be direction to lead someone to the Lord compared to being a stumbling block and to be a terrible witness of God's truth. I'd rather be a leader and I'd rather lead, even if it hurts and even if there's pain, even if it's disagreeable, but I'm leading and I'm leading people to the Lord. I was talking to a young man today and it's just interesting that I, I see him and, and I'll just say, how are you doing spiritually? And he's like, man, you know, every time I see you, this is what he said, Every time I see you, I ask myself that because I don't know why, but every time I see you, it pops in my head. And so I, I kind of shared a little bit more and he's talking with me and so forth. And I says, well, actually I'm a pastor of Calvary Chapel Inland. I'm trying to get you to come out. And um, he goes, oh, where, where are you guys at? So he keeps saying he wants to come out, but he's not there yet. You know, so you're going to lead and people that, that are hungry and want to know the Lord and, and have this desire that something's missing, you could be that tool that God uses compared to a stumbling block because they look at you and they don't know any difference. They don't see no difference in you whatsoever compared to the world. And we're living in a world and Abraham was that man that just stuck out like Noah who stuck out, like Adam who stuck out, you know? And God then used them as they stuck out there in their society. And so Abraham, uh, Abram at this time stuck out and so God began to form a plan for his life. One first is to remove him out of the land of Ur. Gotta get you out of there. Gotta get you isolated. Gotta get you focused. And so I've got to get you out of this. So he then begins to move him out. Now, verse 20, Abram and Nabor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. 
the name of Nabor's wife, Malchai, the daughter of Haran, the father of Micah, and the father of Ishka. And Sarai, who was Sarah later on, was barren. She had no children. And that will be a dilemma later, but God promises to give her a child. So we see uh, Abraham and Sarah here, uh, first known as Abram and Sarai. Abram takes Sarai as his wife, and he finds out that they can't have children, and so they cry out to God. Uh, they live in the land of Ur, and the land of Ur literally means light or fire, probably worshipped fire at that time. Now, God's going to use this family to bring a great nation, the Hebrew nation, the Jewish nation, through Abraham and through the promise of God, not through their flesh and their work, but through grace and God's plan, they will have Isaac. And Isaac will have Jacob. And Jacob will have 12 sons. And these 12 sons will be the nation of Israel. So let's look at now Terah and Abraham, verse 31 and 32. It says, And Terah took his son, Abram, and his grandson, Lot, and son of the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, the son, his son, Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur to the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So two days' journey south of Ur, Ur is where God then begins to send them. So they are leaving, but of course it's not until after Abram's father dies. I think God base, basically said, you need to go out. You need to leave your family. You need to go and I will direct you and lead you. And by the way, as God is leading him, Abraham has no idea what's going to take place. He is going by faith. Like most of us, we walk by faith. We trust in God. You know, when you're in the world, you have this and no fault of your own, but just that we're fleshly, we live in the world and we're trying to figure out things. You have your plans. You have your ideas. You're trying to figure out what life is about. You're trying to figure out why are you here? Why am I married to this person? Why do I have these kids? Why do I have that job? I mean, it's just, that's what God instills in us is this, this big question mark of why do I exist? And, and so you're like on a, a journey of seeking out things. And so you have all these people in the world that are seeking things, you know, like this young man I was sharing with. His idea is that, that he's physically in shape because he's been working out now. And so he's getting his body in shape. He's going to school, so his mind is now being shaped. And so one thing's missing, spiritual. And if I can get the spiritual in shape, man, the possibilities. So that's his thought. Now that's all wrong, right? We all know that because we're believers. He really needs to focus on the spiritual aspect first, where their body's in shape, where their mind is, and God will do the rest. But it's first the spiritual. And so man is constantly seeking something. And they don't realize what they're seeking is God. They're seeking his approval. They're seeking his uh, adoration. They're, they're seeking his presence, really. Because everything else is not going to satisfy them. It just, it just won't. It just won't. Money will not satisfy. Believe me, there have been many people who have died like Robin Williams who weren't satisfied with money. Uh, power, not satisfied. You know, Whatever it is you're seeking, it will not satisfy you. Only God will satisfy you completely. Once you come to God and once you are satisfied, then the world seems to be kind of, kind of, outside of where you're at because now all of a sudden you have this relationship with God you know that his word is true so you have this now desire this hunger to read it and to understand God to grow get to know him what does he want from you now because now it's not why do I exist now it's like what do you want me to do in this life Lord and so, so now the journey is, is finding out what God wants us to do. And obviously, whatever it is, is just to glorify him and be obedient uh, to what he's called us to do.
you go to somewhere like South Sudan, and from what I'm understanding and reading and so forth, uh, their culture there, um, they can have multiple wives. And so these men who have many wives all of a sudden come to the Lord, and now their questions are, what do I do with my wives? Am I supposed to leave them all? What do I do? It's like, wow. The fact that they're even thinking that something's not right there, and they have to change that. Uh, what's the answer to that? I don't know. I know that um, I was told that you tell them you take care of all your wives. <laughs> you know, But I think the real answer is, is that you need to have one wife and you need to take care of all your wives that you had in the past. Don't just leave them, but support them and take care of them. And of course, uh, they demand from the chaplains, you have to ha only have one wife because that's biblical. That's what the Bible teaches. And they're doing that now. They're changing their culture. They're, they're changing their whole view of society and how they thought it should be lived. Why? Because they're now submitted to God's will. And that's what happens to the believer. That's what hap is happening to Abraham. And so he's going to go. He doesn't go right away. His father has to die. And then he's going to go out there into uh, the land of Canaan where, where he will then begin to get direction from the Lord. But he's going to have to go through some processes uh, just like all of us go through process. So the writer here gives us the history of, of Babylon and, and really as one commentator said that Babel's narrative illustrates the false and defiant sense of humanistic so solidarity that sought to invade the creation mandate to fill the earth under God's dominion. I mean, it's just outright wanting to have their way instead of God's way. Um, one day, we know this to be true, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit will come and they will deal with this unity that the world is seeking after today, the one world government, the one world currency, the one world religion that's led by Nimrod. Jesus will then deal with the Antichrist and then he will judge the world. That, that's going to happen. And I think it's going to happen real soon. Something has to happen because our world is getting worse and worse and worse. You know, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. But you know, that cannot be used as an excuse to justify any other sin that we do. We are responsible for ourselves. We really are. When I got saved, <clears throat> there was a lot of garbage in my life. And I could have blamed a lot of people for that garbage. But I realized that they weren't to blame for my actions. The only person to blame for my actions is me. That's it. Because people don't, though they want to push their view, though they would like to manipulate me, though they like to tell me, you know, ultimately, it's my choice. It is my choice to walk with God. It is my choice to be obedient to Him and not to use them as an excuse. The world finds excuses. You go to a psychologist or um, one of those counselors and if they can make an excuse for you and it makes you feel better, oh, they've done their job because now you feel better about yourself. But see, that's not the issue, feeling better about yourself. The issue is being obedient to God. That's the issue. That is really the issue. Um, sometimes we deal with situations and we deal with them in an earthly way instead of dealing them with them in a spiritual way. Taking the opportunity to really let God speak through you because every situation that we're in, God is trying to speak, as I said. Not allowing this world to control you. Not allowing elements to control you whatever situation is but turning them around for the glory of God how do you do that you look at every situation in that light so if you're in a situation and, and let's say you're being accused you turn it around and you say why are you accusing me you know spiritually speaking there's only one accuser that's Satan you know and your accusations are wrong I know them and I stand before my God he is my witness, and I'm not 
doing what you think I'm doing. And so spiritually speaking, I'm all right with God, but you go ahead and keep accusing. You're dealing with a brother, you just bring out scriptures. Say, why are you dealing with this? We shouldn't be dealing with this. This is something that's fleshly. It's something that, that, that we as Christians should not be trying to figure out. We should be forgiving. We should just move on. We should then from this point out, grow and seek the Lord. As Paul said, you know, don't dwell in the past, but keep going to the future. And then make things different at that point. But everything is an opportunity to share. When I used to go out to jobs and I would talk with people, I'd always listen for an opportunity to share. I remember talking to one guy and, and he asked me, so do you got a hobby? Because I could see he had a lot of hobby stuff in his garage. And I says, yeah, I got a hobby. He goes, oh, what is it? I go, I love reading the Bible. I love reading the Bible. And he's like, oh, oh you're religious? <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, I'm not religious. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I love reading about him. He's like, well, I go to church once in a while. So I was able to witness to him. So taking every situation and using it for God's glory, no matter what it is. Even, you know, let, let's say you did something wrong. Maybe you're a criminal and you get caught, but you're a believer and, you know, you fell. You did the wrong thing. And now you just want to do the right thing and just confess it. Hey, I did that and I deserve the sentence. And I'm just going to serve my time and I'm going to serve the Lord while I'm doing that. That's such a great witness to people compared to someone who gets caught and like, I didn't do nothing wrong. Why are you blaming me? You think it's me, but it's not me. You know, and they're just making excuses and excuses. No, no. Hey, I did it. You're right. You know, let, let me serve my time now. I understand that. I have to serve time. I understand all of that. If you could have grace, that'd be wonderful. But if not, I deserve to throw the book at me. You know, I will make the best of it. I will go to prison. I will sit in my cell and I will read my Bible. I will go to the Bible studies and I will witness to everyone around me. See, that's a changed life that takes every situation and turns it around. And I think God saw that in Abraham living in that land. There was something different about him and he chose him to be the father of many nations. God wants to use you right where you're at to glorify him. But he wants you to be used in obedience to his word that you would glorify him.